Hi, this is Nico again with another episode of the Tour On Air podcast. And today I'm joined by Pia Mancini. Um, and I'm very excited to be talking about a broad spectrum um, of uh, topics within the realm of, um, you know, liquid democracy, open democracy, e-government and so forth. Uh, Pia is the founder of Democracy Earth and the Open Collective, um, originally from Buenos Aires, Argentina, but now in beautiful Madrid, Spain. Welcome on the show, Pia. <laughs> Thank you, Nico. Thank you for having me. So I would say as an introduction, always interesting to see kind of like how you actually got to the space that you're operating in, right? Um, maybe talk us through a little bit of some of the early life decisions you made when you were carving out your own path into sort of your professional career. Um, you worked at the, the city government of Buenos Aires, um, I think at a very early time in your career. Mm -hmm. So how did you get interested in, uh, you know, sort of all these government uh, topics that are maybe not um, of everybody's interest at an early age? <laughs> Yeah, I wonder why. Um, so, um, yeah, I come from a family that was very, always very interested in politics. Um, we, both my parents are very, okay, hang on. Argentina in itself is already a very political country, right? Everyone has an opinion about everything, about football and about politics. This is just how it goes. Um, but then my family in particular was also very kind of, um, you know, interested in current affairs and, and politics. And my mother, when she was young, she was also kind of, you know, um, very interested and, 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 and I don't know, today we would call it, an, we would call her an activist. Mm -hmm. um, and then my dad was quite, con is quite conservative. And so I was confronting with him at a very early age. Um, and so already in school, like I was interested in kind of the, I guess, more broad social um, sciences or social aspect of, um, for my career. I was, that was always kind of the, the I knew that that's what I wanted. Um, and so I started working, I was very lucky, I was very fortunate, and, and I was able to do a lot of unpaid work when I was, when I was young, because my parents were able to kind of support me through that. And, um, and I went into political science um, in university against my father's wishes who wanted me to go into economics or something useful, right? Um, and, um, and I started working um, very, very early on doing, you know, internships and, and, and things like that. And then I started just getting paid for the work that I was doing. And I, I worked in every aspect I guess, of the political landscape. I did God, leadership training, like leaders for democracy. I did non for profits I did transparency think tanks, worked for government, um, campaign managed. Um, and that's when, when I was campaign managing, um, that's when I went like, more heavily into politics from political party elections, kind of, and not just from theoretical or or consultancy when you um, felt the adrenaline of yes the campaigning absolutely and, <laughs> and it was great like the way i'm wired campaigning is a really good fit for me um maybe not now anymore because i'm like a bit you know um i'm a mother and older but um when i was younger um just that like working really hard with a group of people to achieve something super concrete um, for a short period of time, like 24 seven full revolutions uh, was great for me because then after a while it's done and you get to kind of oof, till, mm -hmm. right? That's obviously not sustainable, but for like, you know, a certain period of time, like I was, I was really good at that and it was very energizing. And, and I had a lot of fun and I got the opportunity to um, talk with people you know, in all, from all walks of, of life, in all, you know, different spaces from presidents to, you know, grassroots organizers and folks living in shanty towns. And I was able to create connections with all of them. And so that was very useful for me in my, in my work. Like I, and I felt very comfortable 
doing that. Um, and so I kept kind of pushing forward with getting deeper and deeper in the democracy and, and political space. And I read you were a co-founder also of a party. Yes. Partido so, de la Red, the net Partido party. Partido de la Red, yes, the net party. <laughs> Is that yes. something like the, the pirates in Germany? Have you heard of the pirates? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've heard of them. And we were kind of, you know, quite, um, I don't know, inspired in a way mm -hmm. by, 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 by their work. I, we started working... Um, I guess, more active in the political landscape in, in Buenos Aires um, in 2011, 2012. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of that same, you know, um, birth space, right? Occupy, the Green Revolution in Iran, the, um, the different Arab Spring movements, Movimiento 15M, the students in Chile, like that's where I come from. That's kind of the, the political, I guess, era or moments that defined, you know, my choices in life. And the Pirate Party was a big part of that, right? Undeniably. And so we wanted to do, um, we felt it was very stupid that, um, we couldn't engage more in the decision-making process in politics um, when we had the tools to do it. But the reason we weren't participating is because we had, you know, a type of um, a set of political institutions that we've inherited that were designed for a different era, for a different society with different conditions. Um, and institutions do not pop up in the void. They respond to a society, uh, communication technology, a education level. Um, and we are still being governed by the institutions that we're creating for a, for a society that is absolutely different to this one, right? Um, and, and we were very, we thought it was very unfair that we couldn't engage more in the decision-making process. We, we were thinking a lot about participatory politics, participatory democracy, how to bring democracy to the 21st century. Um, and so we built um, this platform called Democracy OS. It's an open source decision-making platform um, that was conceived for citizens to be able to participate in legislative process and legislative decisions so they could vote. So the first thing they could do was kind of read and read a translated version, so an, an explained version of what piece of legislation was being discussed, right? Because legislations today or the political corporation uses um, a lot of legal, judiciary, very spe specific jargon to make it impossible for anyone else to understand, mm -hmm. right? And it's part of the mechanism that, this, that the system has to push people out, right? Constantly, you're either in the know, like, gatekeeper style the church used to do the same like it's not i mean it's a mechanism that is common and um and so we would translate legislation um and then folks could vote how they would they wanted their representatives to vote um and so that was democracy OS, that it was very much inspired in the pirate parties uh, liquid democracy tool um we originally we wanted to adapt it but it was just documentation was in German. I was just I was just hard to reach out to those um, to those guys. I think they were like quite um, jaded by, by by then or or had internal issues. Anyway, so we built Democracy OS and and then we built the political party. Like the political party was a wrapper around mm -hmm. the tool. Like what mattered was the tool, right? What mattered was um, this space for citizen engagement. The, the party was just a vehicle we needed because, again, the political corporation only understands political parties. They, they can't deal with anything else um, just because of how the system is set up. Um, and so when we started offering Democracy OS to other political parties, they were like, yes, no, go outside, you know, play somewhere else. And so we did the net party and, and, the, and the net party was this political party that had democracy as at the center, right? So it was 
was an open source political party, everything you could download and replicate in other countries. You had a key to download logo, um, you know, manifesto, tech, whatever, like the whole thing you could just copy paste um, or like fork and, and do in your own language. Um, and so, um, so the net party, we ran for elections with this idea that we were gonna use um, democracy as to make decisions, mm -hmm. right? We weren't gonna vote in Congress what we felt like, or, or even what we genuinely were convinced that we, we were gonna respect kind of the citizens kind of consensus, I guess, um, on the platform. Yeah. And, and uh, is that something that you then kind of wanted to, was, was that for you kind of like an idea you wanted out and others to run with, um, you know, or was it something where you also wanted to kind of have your own political ambitions uh, kind of empowered by? And yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And no one really tells you what happens to you when you are like flirting with power and, and it's, it's, it's awful. It's really, it's really appalling. Um, so it was a mix, really. Mm. The party, the way the system works in in Argentina, it's a it's a little bit like like the German system that, but it's not mixed. It's just mm -hmm. proportional, right? Mm -hmm. So you have lists of candidates, and then um, you get as many candi you know candidates based on the percentage of vote of mm -hmm. votes that you got. Um, and so it was a list of people. So it was a, it, it, it was a mixed kind of, I guess, host. Um, some people, some of the of the of of the, the party members, they they had tried to be to um, get elected before, or they were part of another party before, and they were disenchanted, or some some of them had been like legislators in the past, and they were like, you know, they came back years later saying, you know, trying to support this new path of doing things. Mm -hmm. Others, um, like me, we didn't particularly had any political ambitions per se, at least not in Congress. Like I, I wanted to do foreign office, for example, like definitely not Congress, um, but it was, you know, it was a path forward. Um, and then, then, you know, a lot of egos involved. Mm -hmm. So a lot of egos to manage. Um, um, I am, look, I don't know, I have mixed feelings. Like we, we almost got a, a seat in Congress. Um, I guess I am, I am glad we didn't and I am, uh, I'm also sad we didn't, right? I think it would have been like amazing to see, to see the whole experiment through. Um, I think it would have been game changing. Um, but also, I, I, I don't think I was up for being four years in, 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 or more in parliament. I don't think that's what I wanted for, for my life. Um, so it was a bit of a bet. So you decided to move on um, from the party, correct? Um, yeah. Is the party something that kind of stuck around? Is it um, still in existence? Yep, the party is still in existence. Um, they run for elections without um, without me um, and without my Santi, who's my partner, who was also a candidate. Mm -hmm. um, I think two more times um, in combination with other parties. Um, and I mean, it's still around, but it's not. It's definitely not running for elections mm -hmm. um, at the moment. And then you kind of went on and I've, you know, trying to connect the dots sort of, you know, what led you to, to uh, then Democracy Earth and, and the Open Collective uh, yeah. platform. Um, but like, I mean, you know, once you tell us about Open Collective, you know, the, mm -hmm. the platform that now um, allows open source projects to collect and spend money, um, mm -hmm. basically. I mean, you know, the you know, let's say the investigative, you know, uh, journalistic part of me would, would be mm -hmm. saying like, you know, how did she get from the party to that? Like, was it a kind of follow the money type of um, situation um, where you thought you, you needed to be closer maybe to actual streams of capital um, in order to have your technology be, you know, adopted or mm. you know, faster um. executed? I never thought of it like that. Um, so what happened was that, so in 2013, no, it's okay, after, after the election, 
I can't remember if after or before the election, we saw that definitely before the election, we saw democracy OS being used in Tunisia to mm-hmm. debate the constitution without us even having anything to do about it, right? Mm-hmm. Someone, you know, these folks from iWatch just Googled voting mechanism, democracy has popped up, they forked it, they translated it to French and Arabic and they were using it. And so for us, for, for me, that was very eye-opening. Like I realized that it wasn't, we had been playing at a local level in Buenos mm-hmm. Aires and that was, that, was, that was great. I think that there is a role for that, but there is also a role for, um, when you see the same language and the same metaphors and the same use of technology emerging in places so diverse as like Tunis and Buenos Aires, you, you get, and, and from there, like, you know, countless, you can, you can see how there is something happening that is like a lot bigger than the city of Buenos Aires, right? And so I wanted to play that game. I wanted to do something that was global um, and not because, um, it had to do with getting funding for that, but because in the same way that I believe that our democratic institutions are not suited for the 21st century, I think nation states are are an artifact of the past, right? I think that the fact that our territory is now the vector is still today the vector that organizes power and organizes our citizenship. It, It just blows my mind, right? In a world, connected as ours, the fact that we still believe in, in these borders and, and, and the fact that the nation state is like the all encompassing political unit. For me, it, it, it's something that I wanted to, to start building around, something that I wanted to, you know, to start pushing the limits of what we understand is possible today. And so I, I, I wanted to operate at a global scale because I think that that's where, that's the next jurisdiction, that's the next frontier in terms of where we're gonna act as citizens. And I also think that it's unbelievably unfair that having a voice is an accident of where you're born, right? The fact that you and me are lucky enough and privileged enough to actually have a voice in this world because we were born in territories that don't have um, um, that have democratic governments or, you know, as democratic as they can, um, but someone who's born on the other side of the border that is not as privileged as we are, doesn't have a voice in the 21st century, I think that's unacceptable, right? And so that took us to, you know, that's, that's what, that's the birth of democracy earth. And Democracy Earth then, before I want to also get back to, you know, that idea of like, you know, organizing power um, and, you know, looking at, you know, what you believe, you know, is the right framework for that. So Democracy Earth then launched the Open Collective or was it something that led to? Yeah, so Democracy Earth was then invited to Y Combinator um, in 2014, 2015. Mm -hmm. Um, so we did YC um, in Silicon Valley, mm-hmm. and uh, we raised some funds there. So Democracy Earth is a non-for-profit, mm-hmm. um, and we worked on on building alternative systems. Essentially, instead of focusing on how do we change the existing system by building a political party and playing the game, we wanted to focus on what would it look like to build an alternative system that make, makes this one up old obsolete right and democracy earth started thinking about that right what is what are global democratic institutions what do they look like how do they feel like what do we need to think what does what identity do we need if we're thinking of global democracy right how do we even manage like identity outside of the nation state right so who's giving you identity today that's not the nation state the corporations Right, so in this kind of fight between the land and the cloud, where do we sit? What does the network sit? Like what solutions can we provide? So that was Democracy Earth. And, um, um, and so we, we ran with those ideas for a while. We, we wanted, we had this kind of mix of working with local politics in the US, but also kind of thinking globally and things started to 
create a bit of dissonance in, 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 in my brain. And then I got pregnant during YC. I was there with, with Santi, with my husband. And so when I got pregnant, I, I, I wanted to take a step back from, at that stage, I had done a TED talk that was very popular. So I was like doing a lot of podcasts and interviews and TV shows. And, and I was like, I need, I need to take a step back from all of this. Um, I also thought it was utterly impossible to work with my husband and have a child with him. It's like, this is not going to work. So I, I, I'm going to take a step back from democracy earth <laughs> because I'm going to kill you. And it's not healthy for me or for our future daughter. So um, I stopped working on democracy. Earth. I was still on the board and obviously, you know, I'm still a big part of, of what's happening there, but I wanted something that was, I needed something that was my own. Um, and so that's when Open Collective started. I, um, it was like, I, I guess, October, late October in 2015. And this friend of mine, uh, Xavier Daman, or Xavier Daman, who I met through the World Economic Forum in Dubai, he's like, I'm in San Francisco, you know, let's meet. And I'm like, okay, great. And he's like, he had just sold a company called Storyfy. Um, I don't know if you remember, like a Twitter threading company very, very early on kind of Twitter stuff. He had just sold Storyfy. He was looking for his next thing. He met up with me and he's like, I want to do something with you. What are you doing now? And I'm like, I'm nine months pregnant. So what, what do you think I'm doing? <laughs> like take a wild guess, my <laughs> darling. And, um, and, um, and so he's like, oh, I, I've been thinking about this this problem that communities around the world, you know, they can't get um, funding because, you know, we had this problem where we were doing, I don't know what the startup manifesto in Belgium and we needed to pay for stickers and no one wanted to put their own bank account. Oh, how can it be that, you know, in order to receive money, you need to incorporate, you know, I don't wanna be the president of anything. This is a movement and I'm like, the same thing happened to me in Argentina with the net party. We couldn't raise funds, campaign money, because the government didn't allow, you know, our legal entity. And so we couldn't receive any money because the bank couldn't obviously open a bank account without a legal entity. And that is so unfair, right? It's unfair on communities. Um, and so we started Open Collective, which is, it is solving that problem. Open Collective sets out to solve how communities around the world can get funding, um, raise and spend money transparently without needing to become something they're not, without needing their own legal entity or their own bank account to do it. Um, and how and do that you was... circumvent that? How do you circumvent? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so we use um, a combination of, uh, it's a two-part solution. We have an open finances platform that is opencollective.com where you can create your collective so you have that kind of organizational structure and then that is paired with a global network of legal entities that become custodials of the funds for Got those it. communities mm -hmm. so it's like fiscal sponsorship as a service but mm -hmm. fiscal sponsorship is a very american as in united states concept um, it doesn't really exist around the world and it has never been used mm -hmm at the scale that Open Collective uses it. Like we, we are, you know, really pushing the limits on, on what fiscal sponsorship is like, was built for. Um, and so now we have a network of over 300 non-for-profits around the world that give support. And by support, I mean, they, they kind of lend their bank account. Um, they give fiscal sponsorship to, um, I don't know, thousands and thousands and like tens of thousands of communities around the world. So the open source is like one of the communities that we serve the most. Um, we have a non-for-profit that is called the Open Source Collective that I created and that it gives um, fiscal sponsorship. So it's the custodial of the funds of over 3000 open source projects, right, around the world. So you know, Google wants to give money to a project that they're using because they're working in the, I don't know, in a framework that they're using yeah. or they're, you know, they're developing tools for Chromium, whatever it is. They can't send money from a corporation in the United States or anywhere else really to a PayPal account in Ukraine. Like for Google, it, that, that is a nightmare, yeah. right? And so they turn around, they give the open source collective, they have a fund with us, a multi-million dollar fund, and then we turn around and we disperse all the money 
because we fiscal sponsor all of these projects. So like that, we have 300 of those examples. Um, Incredible. I, I was th never aware of that. Is that a, um, I mean, you know, that, that kind of fiscal sponsorship model in general, is that a um, function of kind of the Googles of this world having also very administrative process in, you know, having vendors um, identified, um, or is yeah. it really also, you know, legal implications, like you, you were saying you weren't actually able um, to create an entity in Argentina? And uh, does that happen a lot around the world? And what are the reasons for it? Um, you know, yeah, for, so for an open source, you know, project or, or I guess a charity to, to create their own entity? Well, an open source project is someone in New York, someone in Ukraine, someone in Bangladesh, someone in, you know, wherever, yeah. like we, op we collaborate in the, the way we work has mm. radically changed. The way we do activism change, the way we organize change, but the financial system are, only understands corporations or the individual, right? They understand corporations, whether they're for profit or non-profit. But the mindset is you, you are incorporated in a territory, right? You have a hierarchical structure. You have someone who has the signature of the bank account, essentially. Um, you yeah. have either equity or ownership of some sort. You have quite complex transitional processes. Um, and most importantly, you're somewhere in the world and you operate in a scarcity driven economy. So for example, corporations can't make gifts to one another. There's no such thing as a company making a donation to another company that doesn't, that doesn't compute, right? Because that's, that's not how the system understands or they understand the individual. What the system does not understand is a group of people that come together, they have a shared purpose, mm -hmm. a shared mission, but they don't want to become something they're not. A, because it's impossible for them to incorporate in a territory because they are scattered around the world, um, which is most of today's global movements. Um, or B, even if you are in the same space, think about a mutual aid group, right? Right now in New York, New York, New York is a hotbed for mutual aid groups. I have so many of them on the platform. And there are people just coming together, supporting each other, pulling money to support their neighbors in times of, of COVID, right? Um, and uh, the IRS will give you a charity status in like two years, but that person is going to get evicted today, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so what these groups used to resort to is mm -hmm. someone putting their own bank account for it, right? So it's like, we are a neighborhood, you know, let's pull money together. Okay, uh, you can use my bank, bank yeah. account, but then it's yeah. complicated for the person that receives the money, mm -hmm. um, can have huge tax implications, there's also a trust issue, right? Sure. And so, so what we do is we're like, do not worry about that. We'll abstract out all of the complexity of dealing with this clunky and old operating system that is designed for a different era. You just focus on your impact. You focus on, your, on what you have to do. So, so I guess going back to your original question, you of joining the dots. I think it has mm -hmm. to do with that. It has to do with building alternative systems, but without fighting nation states anymore, like I used to with politics, without trying to go against or, or trying to rewire. It's more, it's more about building around it. What structures can we build around that? Like, how can we push the system in a way where okay, fine, whatever, this is how you understand things, we'll just, you know, we'll just let you be, but we're going to build all of this somewhere else, yeah. right? So, so that's, that's what kind of guides me, I guess, or, or yeah, the thread is like, how do, how do we make existing institutions obsolete? It's like you're updating the rails of the yes. kind of... Yes. Uh, of the system, right? Of the infrastructure, yes. you know, and, yes. and rails being a word, of course, often used in, in the blockchain and, and crypto world, um, you know, that begs me to ask, of course, like in, in what way do you see, you know, um, you know, DAOs and, you know, blockchain crypto playing a role in this um, today for you um, and in, in the future? Because wouldn't that yeah. be the ultimate technology also to further that goal? Yeah, absolutely. So Democracy Earth in itself is very much embedded in that space. They created yeah. um, 
proof of humanity, they have the, the UBI token, the proof of humanity DAO. Um, and um, can you tell us a little about the proof of humanity? Yeah, so proof of humanity is, um, is so going back to what I was saying before about global democratic institutions, one of yep. the, the main problems that you need to solve for is how do you validate identity, right? How do you, um, and this is something that with Democracy OS, we also learned the hard way. How do you prevent civil attacks, right? Civil attacks being people with multiple, the same person creating yep. multiple identities to vote. Um, and it's a really, really, really difficult problem to solve in, in distributed uh, decentralized networks. It's very difficult. And um, because it's, it's difficult because you don't have a central authority that is going to give you your credentials, right? The yeah. way that nation states solve for civil attacks in um, elections is that you have your government issued ID, right? Um, or if you log in with Facebook, then Facebook tells you you've already used this login, you can't have multiple Facebook accounts, whatever it is. Um, and so when you don't have a central authority, it's very difficult to validate identity. So proof of humanity, kind of it's, it's an attempt to create a first, like a base layer for a global identity, which is at least certifying that an address in Ethereum, in the Ethereum blockchain is a human. Right, and so it has an, an app that you upload um, a video of you saying, "My name is Pia Mancini, and I certify that I'm a human, and I certify that I don't have a registry um, in this uh, register already." Yeah. And then you read the Ethereum address. You have to show the Ethereum address that you linked to that profile. Right, so. And you stake, you stake something that is, I can't remember exactly what it is, but like, let's say $500 in Ethereum or something yeah. like that, right? So that's your stake. And, and then a lot of people, um, so someone in your network vouches for you, right? And says like, yeah, I know Pia, this is her, you know, and, and, and you vouch. Mm -hmm. um, and then once someone vouches for you, then you have a period of challenge. And that's where a lot of people try to challenge your profile because then they keep your stake right mm -hmm. so they try to say you know this is a deep fake and yeah. they prove this or and and so the challenge goes to a distributed code called yeah. Kleros, yeah. um and then it goes to the Kleros doers and they they you know they 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 um they have to say if the challenge you know has it's right or not validate um, yeah yeah, validate exactly. And so, if you lose, you lose the money, yeah. and and then if the challenger loses, they lose the gas they used for the challenge. Um, and so, right now, there's about ten thousand strong, maybe twelve thousand um, humans. So it's a, it's 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 that base layer, right? It's like that first moment where you say, if we ever need to come together as humans, regardless of my name, where I am in the world. You know, if just the fact that we are humans mm -hmm. allows us to participate, then you can use proof of humanity already, which is amazing, right? Because, and that's what, what the UBI token is using. Yeah. So once you get validated as a human, you start accruing UBI. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which, which makes total sense to not have multiple wallet addresses, right? Um, and be able to participate multiple times in a UBI project, for example. Fascinating. Yeah. And for you um, in now your you know, open collective, is, is blockchain already uh, on the roadmap? Or yeah. Integrated? So blockchain, no. Like we do receive crypto for projects yeah. and things like that. Um, I don't know. I've been coming and going with this for so many years. Like I think I did, you know, two bull bull cycles. <laughs> Every time there's a bull market, you know, the same question comes back. Like, why aren't you doing crypto? Blah, blah, blah. And then the bear market comes and they leave me alone for a little while. And, then, um, and it's I, I think it's something that for me it's the future. Clearly, like we've been, you know, invested in 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 crypto. We we use it. We you know we we've done a gazillion things with that. Um, and I think DAOs are the future. 
I think that there is like a huge gap still between that world and everyone else who needs money today. And so I guess it's about figuring out the right time for this to make sense. Like today, just to give you an idea, the type of problems that some users of the platform have is that they can't understand how to use a PayPal account to receive a donation, mm -hmm. right? So um, uh, we were talking to uh, an organizer the other day and he, he called this like a digital apartheid, which I thought it was a very interesting concept, right? It's like, you're, you know, and even Open Collective that we, we work so hard to be, you know, as easy and inclusive and, you know, low tech as possible, we are so high tech still. Sure. And, and it makes sense, right? Because, you know, that's how you do things fast. You, that's how you organize. That's how we can actually host thousands of projects. Otherwise it would be impossible for us to have, you know, a manual process for this. Um, but at the same time, like we can't leave a lot of people behind. There's always gonna be folks that are, you, are not, coming into new systems. And that is something that we all need to live with. Um, but I think that still the gap between this and DAOs is huge. It's just too big still. Like usability, um, understanding, um, it's just, it's not there yet, right? So, um, you know, I've talked with many um, projects like Colony or Gitcoin or Maker to have like DAOs for the collectives. And I think I want to do this. Mm. Um, I just, it's just not there yet. Like yeah. it's just, we're, ideally, we're not there. Ideally, I guess it, it is at a stage where those using it don't even realize they're using that technology. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It is. It is. You know, like we don't know uh, that SMTP, you know, is empowering exactly. our email, and it it just works. Um, yeah. And we don't really care that much, even as a user, maybe. Um, but the functionality um, is there. Um, yeah. So I want to spend the last minutes. You know, one going again a little bit. You know, back to the the macro, which I thought was mm -hmm. you know interesting. You know, your um, you know idea of you know kind of empowering or, or having a power structure on a very macro level um, sort of multi-lateral uh, um, you know mm -hmm. above kind of the nation state mm -hmm. um, is that like you know I guess for like the large challenges that we face as humanity um, and do you see that then paired with very local decision making and mm -hmm. regional decision making when it comes to you know a lot of the things that um, you know citizens are in, impacted uh, with on a daily basis yeah absolutely i think you're yeah right on the money um i think that if i if i i'm reading the signals correctly which mm -hmm. i might not be um if but if i if i'm reading the signals correctly i think that um the world is going to go towards um above nation states and mm -hmm. we're going to kind of have a new jurisdiction that is global, that it's planetary, where we can come together as peers, that we share a commons and that commons is our planet and we have agency at that level. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's gonna go down to um, um, city level, mm -hmm. right? Where we have a different type of agency. Right, and we are much more involved in day-to-day decision-making process. I think, I think the the nation state that it's like sandwiched in the middle is going to start disappearing. Um, it's disintermediated, like yeah, every other middleman. Exactly, exactly. And look, we still, I think that we still need some, and we'll still see some, or like most of the capabilities still, um, especially until. Um, distributed generation of energy is actually the, it's a, it's a thing, right? If we still have extractive industries and and that's what powers our grid mm -hmm. um, at, at at that like national level, I think that the nation state will still have uh, power. But if you think about it, like you have now um, you have collectives that mm -hmm. can issue their own their own currency. 
right? So the nation state already lost one of its biggest monopoly, that it was that they could own, they and only they could mint a currency, right? And force it down the throats of their citizens. Again, I'm from Argentina, you know, you, you know how it feels. And, um, and so, but the nation states now, now lost the monopoly on, on, on issuing currencies. And this is something that cost them a lot, in, not only in terms of, um, or will in terms of taxes, which is only gonna grow, like what is costing them in terms of, of taxes, but also um, in terms of like an intangible um, soft power, mm -hmm. right? The currency um, and the territory and the nation, they all kind of, they were the tools that nation states used to become the default kind of yeah. vector, right? Like the idea of the nation is tied with the idea of a currency. That's that's how they justify themselves, if you want. That's how we justify being different from those across a fictional border from the other side of the mountain, right? So it's language, so vernacular languages, so um, languages, um, currency, like, you know, that's the nation. That's part of like the excuse, I guess, the narrative they this, the nation states built. Um, so that's you know that's one thing that one pillar that I think is dropping. Another another um, issue is that um, issues are not national anymore; they're yeah. global. It doesn't matter. Like pick any issue, like it doesn't matter. They're, they're, they're all global issues. Like the challenges of our generation are not going to be solved by nations. That's yeah. for sure. Like we know that you, you me, we know that, right? Um, and it doesn't matter what they think because it's not about them. It's about like the huge challenges have to do with, you know, pandemics, uh, climate change. It, it's global, right? So they're less important. They don't matter. Uh, and you saw this when Trump pulled out of the Paris Accord, right? The climate uh, yeah. Paris Accord. Like what 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 you saw. Like next was a whole group of universities, cities, companies saying like, we don't care if Trump pulls out of the accord, we're still gonna do our, our you know, we're still gonna um, honor those commitments because yeah. it doesn't matter what Trump decides. And yeah. that was a huge blow also to kind of nation states. Of course, there's a lot of pushback at the moment because progress works like that, it's push and push back, right? So we are seeing now like, a big rise in nationalisms, but it's a reaction towards, it's a reaction to the decay that they're seeing, right? So they need to kind of push harder. Um, so would you say also, you know, when you see kind of losing interest in, you know, organizations like the WHO or, you know, the European Union, um, you know, do you see like, you know, or better, like, I, I think the, the part of like, you know, local, uh, you know, e-government and participation on a local level, I, I think, you know, is on somewhat on a good track, mm -hmm. um, relatively speaking. Um, mm -hmm. But like when it comes to this kind of multilateral, you know, global cooperation around topics, it really does seem like um, we took a step back um, in the last years. So. So we took a step back because nation states are pushing for that. But mm. we, I think that if you think about nation states, like we as citizens are much more, I think, aware than ever that we can act as citizens in the world and mm. not as Argentinians or Germans, right? Um, I think that mentality has changed and the internet really helped with that kind of intercitizenships, right? With that kind of multiple um, identities where, where you're born doesn't matter so much. As I said, mm -hmm. you know, in your, I mean, still matters in the sense that we're still forced to live under these, you know, these, these um, institutions, but it, it matters less in terms of how you construct your identity, right? Or yeah. it's just one piece of your identity. Um, so I agree with you that I think technology is not there in the sense of, sure, you know, probably blockchains are the one piece of technology that is able to coordinate 
collaboration at scale without a central authority. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can still safely or accurately or you know that friendly use blockchains to participate at this kind of jurisdiction, right? I think that this is the beginning of that. That we're not there. I agree with your analysis. I think we're not there yet, but I do think that it's the beginning of that. Um, I think we need to create the networks for also for this to happen. I think we, um, you know, we could think about. There's this project that is incredible. That what they're trying to do is they're trying to get like one billion whatever euros or dollars it doesn't really matter, and um, and then get 200 million young people from around the world to vote on a participatory budgeting um, process on how to execute that billion, right? Mm -hmm. And um, what's beautiful about this is like, it's not the money and it's not the participatory process, although it's great and I would love to see mm -hmm. how that goes and I, and I wanna be involved in that, but it's the network you create, mm -hmm. right? You, you create fabric, social fabric at that scale, and that doesn't disappear. Once you've connected all of these people, once they felt part of this collective that goes so beyond their, you know, yeah. um, nations, that is something that never goes. It's like unlearning how to read. You can't do it, like, right? So, so I, I am a very big believer in building this type of projects that create that kind of social yeah. fabric at a planetary scale. I think we need to start thinking at that level and funding things like that. That's a great point. And uh, yeah, definitely, you know, bullish there, you know, seeing just the projects that are being created with the blockchain and, you know, whether this is followed with another bear market and whatever the length of the next crypto winter is, um, you may have that lasting um, kind of effect, right, of task collaboration uh, yeah. across borders. I'm seeing it with the mutual aid groups. I'm yeah. seeing it at that scale. Like I think that post-pandemic, all of these mutual aid groups, many of them are going to be like activists burnout, but many of them are going to, and I'm already seeing them, they're transforming themselves from just let's buy groceries to folks who are quarantined um, mm -hmm. or, you know, let's do some cash assistance for those who are getting evicted or food pantries, but they're already transforming into like those networks are built, that social fabric it now exists, right? And so those collectives, those uh, groups are not going to disappear. They're just going to become advocacy groups. They're going to become something else, right? Mm -hmm. But they're going to be there. And uh, I am very hopeful about that. I am, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an optimist about, about that in particular, because not only people showing up for each other in times of crisis, which we've done over and over, but also these networks that we're creating that they're, it's like building capacity now yeah. for social tissues and, and activism and um yeah so have you I watched think... a boy sorry no 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 just yeah before they... i take it to profanity uh have you watched boy state no oh you have to watch boy state um okay highly, <laughs> highly recommend it um, i will it's a it's an apple documentary about a uh i think it's a thousand uh teenagers from across the united states that come together once a year um, it's conservatives, conservative teenagers that come together once a year uh, for a few days to form a government. Right. Um, Interesting. In a, in a big hotel. Um, mm. And, you know, a lot of famous uh, Republicans were part of those boys' states. Uh, so I think Cheney and, you know, maybe not the best examples. Mm. But, <laughs> uh, but but a uh, but a few, and I think not even only uh, conservatives. I think Cory Booker was was also part of that. Um, it's a uh, it's it's really interesting movie, uh, definitely worth watching. Yeah. Um, and maybe a good segue because we are reaching the end of uh, the podcast. Um, you know, very briefly, I want to talk German politics with you. Are you following it? Um, is it important for Europe? Um, German politics, of course, it's important to you for Europe. I Maybe mean, it's important, uh, but it's so boring huge. that nobody cares. Or is it good that it's so boring? I think it's good that it's boring. <laughs> um, I think Angela Merkel did a 
great job at being boring. And I think that, you know, I lived in Argentina and the United States um, yeah. for the past, like whatever years. Trust me, boring is great. <laughs> I mean, boring is what we need. Um, I think that um, it's not inspirational, obviously, but I think that, again, it's, um, it's the role of government as a more technocratic or bureaucrat um, aspect of organizing society. And, um, and I think that as drab as that sounds, that is okay, right? We need to, we need that um, still. Um, so yeah, I'm not following too closely, but you know, I'm glad they're there. <laughs> we'll know in two weeks. <laughs> um, and then lastly, uh, there's a question I ask everybody on the show, and I think it's very relevant actually to what you're doing um, or have been doing. Um, and it's a, it's a question around sort of pivot versus iteration. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm. you know, looking at the project that you've done and, you know, trying to connect the dots, um, you know, I really thought that that question with you, uh, you know, may, may resonate more than with other um, people mm. that we have on the show. So it's that idea of, you know, I'm, you know, creating a product, a project, um, and often I feel that people get to this crossroad where they have to decide, do I just have to keep on iterating because, you know, I'm actually onto something here and I need more time and more iteration, um, or is it really time um, to make a, a bigger uh, mm. pivot into a totally different direction um, and just let go um, of what maybe I believe to be the route to success. And, mm. uh, and I'm looking for kind of mental, you know, models or how people come to that decision, um, you know, once they've taken it, like what led to their decision? Is it internal soul searching? Is it, you know, benchmarking to other people one admires? Is it getting advice from friends and family? Um, is it making lists, you know, with pros and cons? And just wondering if you, you know, in those, you know, steps of, you know, your career and the different projects that you were involved with, um, I mean, must have been hard to leave some behind mm, um, for sure. and, and, and kind of really pivot into something new. Uh, how did mm. you make those decisions? So that's a really good question. So in general, I have strong beliefs, strong ideas, but very loosely held, right? So, so in general, that's how I operate, right? I, when, when I believe that something is the right path, like I believe it very strongly um, and I push for it. But then I'm also easily convinced to go in a different way or to drop it. Right. And Open Collective has, has, has had that. Like we've, you know, we are like, this is, you know, what we need to do and the path forward. And then it's like, this wasn't it. Bye. <laughs> you know, so we, um, I guess in my role as leader of Open Collective, I, I guess I imprinted somehow this idea of having strong beliefs, but loosely held to the, to the team and to the product. So, um, what I, what I like about, about that, and this is something that is very intuitive to me, like I don't, you know, that this is something that comes natural. Um, I never fall in love fully with ideas or with mm -hmm. products or with features and because I understand there is a big risk in doing that, right? So while I believe it's the, the right thing and I believe it very strongly, I never kind of fall, blindly fall in love with that. Right, so we've changed. That said, um, in Open Collective, we've been more on the iterating side for the global strategy, and we pivot when things at the implementation level don't work. Mm -hmm. Right, so our strategy has remained the same. Like every year, we get together and like, re let's rethink our mission, and we always end up with the same mission statement. <laughs> like it's just, you know, and we are honestly very prepared to say like what is our mission let's rethink it and we always end up with the same yeah. so um but when it comes to you know feature implementation we've done a gazillion things and then we pivot it very quickly to something radically different um and that's kind of inside the company and then in like more life decisions about going to open collective for me was probably the one decision that uh, was harder for me because i had a lot of 
baggage, a very public persona, very, very public persona around the democracy work. Um, and I had to turn around and say, okay, I'm doing a company that's a for-profit venture. And sure it has, it's a missions, you know, driven company. And, you know, we're doing, we're doing something good in the world. Like I honestly believe that, um, but it has investors, it has equity, right? It has all the things that are, you know, weird for someone like me. Um, and so I guess when I decided to pivot and um, it, that was a hard pivot from Democracy Earth into Open Collective, I realized that I, I had an audience of one and that was myself. That as long as I could build the narrative for myself and I really thought about the narrative, I'm like, how am I explaining this to myself, right? What is the thread? That thread that you mentioned is like the same question that I asked myself in 2015. How are you, how are you joining these dots? You know, they're so far away. Um, and I realized that I was the only person that deserved an explanation. And once I realized that I worked on, on, on my own narrative for myself mm -hmm. and then that was it. Then I just moved on, right? Um, so sometimes it happens to founders or, or, you know, public people or, you know, activists that you feel like you owe a lot of the explanation to a lot of people if you're gonna pivot and sometimes you just, it's just yourself you need to convince. And once you realize that, it's a lot easier. Um, yeah. Great answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> and then lastly, um, just, you know, last question is, you know, typically we ask around sort of, you know, the founder struggles, you know, then you kind of like mental health, you know, staying sane in the whole process, staying fit, staying energetic, are there any things that you can recommend that you do? Any routines, any daily things, uh, no meeting days can be very trivial, um, but often very helpful to people. Yeah. Um, so yes, I have a ton of life hacks. <laughs> um, so I definitely exercise every morning. The first thing I do after I ship Roma to school is I do 10, 20, half an hour, whatever, but like I do some exercise. Mm -hmm. like. I think that that keeps me sane. Um, then I have an open calendar um, that people just book meetings with me, mm -hmm. but I have like very like very restrictive slots in the day. Yeah, I so was about any, to say, yeah. Yeah, anyone needs something, <laughs> they can book here. If there's nothing for the next month, you know, yeah. that's, that's, that's what it is, right? Yeah. Um, and then my other more open calendar for meetings and calls starts like at midday. So I always have the mornings for um, doing work. Otherwise yeah. for founders, like you, you are, you know, your chief Zoom officer, you know what I mean? Like you're gonna spend all day in a, in, in a call if, if you let. And, yeah. um, and I think that blocking time is, uh, yeah, it's very important. That reminds me of the maker, sorry to interrupt, the maker mm -hmm. schedule. Uh, you read that post from YC founder, Paul Graham. No. Um, oh, that's a great one. Okay, I'll have to send you two things. Um, <laughs> okay. And also for the listeners out there, the maker versus manager schedule was right. an essay written by Paul Graham um, of Y Combinator, which, which I think is you know genius. I think I've talked about mm -hmm. it already on the show, but I also adhere to it very much. Um, some people, you know, really cannot operate on a meeting schedule. They need, you know, lots of free time blocks because mm. even if you have a day and there's only two meetings, but if they're placed at 10 and 2 p.m., for some people that just disrupts the entire flow of the day so mm -hmm. much that, you know, they they really suffer productivity from it. Um, so I personally also just have, you know, uh, some days uh, a week, uh, two actually at the moment, depending always on what stage of the project we are in, mm. um, where I try to really not have any external meetings whatsoever. It's just, mm. you know, maybe, you know, an internal meeting here and there, but um, just have it free um, for actually work. So, but and sorry. Other, no, yeah. that, but the other thing that I did very early on, um, and I think that for founders who are not engineers like me, yeah. that are founders of a tech company, so you have an engineering team, um, take time off and get someone on the engineering team to do the work that you normally do. So for example, very mm -hmm. early on, I used to do all support, onboarding, mm -hmm. paying expenses when there was three of us mm -hmm. for Open Collective. Um, I essentially did everything that wasn't like writing code. Mm -hmm. um, but then I would always take two weeks off 
um, in the holidays. And then one of my other two co-founders that were doing engineering had to reply to support, oh, pay expenses yeah. and do that. That's how I got everything done, right? Because when I got back, I had like systems for automating everything. <laughs> That's great little hack. Yes. I love that. Yes, I still do it to this day. <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. I'll remember mm. that. All right, Pia, thank you so much um, for sharing your time. And um, we hopefully speak again and maybe also, you know, get you to one of our physical, you know, in real life uh, type of gatherings soon. Yeah, so, totally. Um, yeah, all the best okay. to you. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you.